Uh, this is the second day. Welcome to the second day of our Race, Democracy, and Public Policy in America conference from LBJ's Great Society to Barack Obama and Black Lives Matter. Uh, we had a great um, opening day. Charlene Hunter Galt, uh, the civil rights icon and journalist, um, uh, gave us our opening keynote. Uh, we had a wonderful um, set of panels and presentation uh, on everything from um, Ferguson and political activism and policy in Ferguson, Missouri, to um, uh, Nina Simone in Mississippi Goddamn, to uh, uh, a presentation on uh, public policy and the Great Society and the unfinished legacy of the Great Society and how that connects with Black Lives Matter. So we're really here together over uh, these two days to talk about race, democracy, and public policy uh, in historical ways, but also in contemporary ways, in an interdisciplinary perspective. Today, after our keynote speaker, we've got um, a panel on uh, mass incarceration uh, and civil rights. Uh, we're going to have an evening forum on bridging America's racial and policy divide. And we have a panel on uh, racial justice, public policy, and grassroots activism in Obama's uh, America. And um, I'd like to thank the LBJ School of Public Affairs uh, for um, helping us to uh, organize and um, sponsor this conference. Um, this is the inaugural event for the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy, uh, which is a center at the LBJ School, which is uh, really devoted to being a, a policy resource, a history resource, and a, and a source of um, intellectual expertise um, on these issues of race and democracy and the way in which they impact all of us uh, right here in Austin and around the world, Austin, the state of Texas, and around, and around the nation. Um, our keynote speaker uh, today is a, a very uh, dear friend and a, a, a really important uh, historian and intellectual, and also somebody who's done a lot of work nationally on um, teaching pedagogy and teaching teachers how to think about race uh, and African American history and, and policy and politics when they're teaching um, high school students. Uh, his, his address is, gonna, is entitled For Ourselves and Our Posterity, Barack Obama and the Continuing Struggle for a Just Democracy. Uh, Yuhuru Williams is Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and Professor of History at Fairfield uh, University. Um, he has uh, many, many um, different accolades. I'll read uh, some. Uh, he's the author of several books, including uh, Black Politics and White Power, Civil Rights, Black Power, and the Black Panthers in New Haven, um, and Rethinking the Black Freedom Movement. He is the editor of uh, numerous books um, and co-editor of In Search of the Black Panther Party, uh, New Perspectives on the Revolutionary Movement, and Liberated Territory Toward a Local History of the Black Panther Party. Um, I first uh, encountered Yuhuru's work uh, in 1999, um, in November of 1999, at um, an obscure uh, popular cultural history conference that I went to in Valley Forge. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I listened to his work, and he had a brand new book that um, was about to come out, and uh, you know, was so excited. Uh, at the time, I was 20, uh, uh, 26 years old, 27 years old. Uh, so excited to meet um, a young uh, brother who was so brilliant. And uh, that friendship has continued to grow. And his work has just been completely phenomenal. I think that he is an extraordinary speaker and uh, public intellectual, and really somebody who cares deeply about these pedagogical, uh, uh, these pedagogical um, implications of all of our work. So how our work connects to public history, but also how um, our work is going to be interpreted at the secondary level. So he's done so much with teachers. Because we've been talking, and Charlene hunter Galt talked about how part of the problem with civil rights is that young people don't know the story. And the people who really tell young people the story initially before they get to a place like UT 
or our graduate students at the LBJ school are high school teachers. So we have to connect with high school teachers and talk to them about history and policy and race and how they can teach those things in the classroom if we're gonna have any kind of change in progress. So looking forward to this um, and without further ado, Yuhuru Williams. I want to thank Peniel for inviting me. I can't believe it's been that long, Peniel. Really, it's been that long. It's been that long. You look great, and I look older. Um, I want to spend some time, and I also want to thank the Center for Race and Democracy here at University of Texas, the LBJ Center, for hosting this conference. It is, of course, an important conference. And I want to talk to you a little bit about this. Charlene, in a way, stole my title. Because a couple of years ago, when we first had this conference, the title of my talk was We the People. And when uh, Fran wrote and said, do you want to be a, a speaker? Would you like to join us? I said, yeah, definitely. It's going to be a more perfect union. She said, actually, that's already taken. So we kind of moved down in the preamble a bit, but you'll see that our, our talks connect very, uh, very well. It's great to be at the LB, LBJ Center because it gives me an opportunity to quote uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, one of my favorite presidents. Uh, he once said, did you ever think making a speech on economics is a lot like pissing down your leg? It seems hot to you, but it never does to anyone else. I hope that what I talk about with you today will be as hot to you as it is to me. I also want to begin with some conventional wisdom from Jimmy Baldwin who said, and this is critical, at least in terms of the intellectual enterprise we find ourselves in today. The world changes according to the way people see it. And if you can alter even by a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. In a lot of ways, what's so powerful about the Obama moment, the Obama phenomena, the age of Obama, we were talking about this at dinner last night, is that, in some sense, Obama has changed our reality. Uh, I look at this cartoon from 2008, Adam Zeiglis, and he's got Obama situated at the front of the bus. But what was powerful and important to me about it is that it's not just the imagery of Obama being at the front of the bus, it's the type of bus it is, and a representation of the history that's encapsulated in this image. Because certainly by putting Obama at the front of the bus, it's not just saying that finally you have an African American in the White House, but the front of the bus has come to symbolize Rosa Parks in Montgomery 1955. But it's also a school bus. It's Brown versus Board of Education. In some sense, Obama was supposed to be the culmination of the civil rights movement. He himself talked about it in his campaign. And in some senses, that was problematic because we find ourselves seven, eight years into his term looking at the work of ta Coates, who titles it Between the World and Me, and for all of you that teach African-American history, that teach literature, that know African-American history and know African-American literature, you know he's actually inverting the words of a very famous African-American scholar, W.E.B. Du Bois. Because it was Du Bois who wrote in 1903, not Between the World and Me, but Between Me and the World, there is an ever unasked question, unasked by some through feelings of delicacy, by others through the difficulty of rightly framing, all nevertheless flutter around it. They approach me in a half-hesitant sort of way, eye me curiously or compassionately, and then instead of saying directly, how does it feel to be a problem? They say, I know an excellent colored man in my town. Or I fought at Mechanicsville. Or do not these southern outrages make your blood boil? At these I smile or am interested or reduce the boiling to a simmer as the occasion may acquire to the real question, how does it feel to be a problem? I answer seldom a word. Obama got to be president. But it doesn't mean that we've solved the problem of race. And it certainly doesn't mean that we've moved any closer to perfecting the democratic enterprise. I'm going to talk more about that in just a second. But when we talk about the problem, this is an issue that goes back to 1865. I think this is very powerful. It's a cartoon from 1863 uh, after Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. And it's a problematic and troubling image in some ways, but it depicts this giant behemoth, this giant elephant. And the caption reads, the man who won the elephant at the raffle. But the question is, what am I to do with the creature? Congratulations, Mr. Lincoln. You just freed four and a half million people who used to be slaves. Now what? What's their social status going to be in the new republic? What's their political status going to be in this new republic? What's their economic status going to be in this new republic? And if you haven't thought through those issues, thought through those questions, be aware because you've just unleashed a revolution, which you are not in a position to control. 
We know how those, answers were answer, those questions were answered in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, through segregation, through the poll tax, literacy test, grandfather clause, through economic chicanery. But the problem for us is that it doesn't mean that that moment wasn't born of the promise of American democracy. It doesn't mean that we robbed from, from Abraham Lincoln and the radical Republicans in Congress their intent to ensure a just democracy. It doesn't mean that we divorced them from what Christopher Eisgruber from Princeton University has described as our enterprise toward moving toward a society which is more democratic and just. Eisgruber has written, it's important, American government aspires to be both democratic and just. But the problem is, to insist that justice and democracy coincide makes heavy, but we may hope not unreasonable, demands upon the American people. And I love what he says here. Until evidence forces us to give up the hope for a just democracy, the constitutional enterprise compels us to treat that hope as reasonable. You know what happens when people believe that we have the power to achieve a just democracy? They do crazy things like refusing to give up their seat on a Montgomery bus. They do crazy things like moving into intersections and demanding marriage equality. They do crazy things like insisting that we can have economic justice. And those things historically have moved our democracy forward. Having said that, I want to be very clear about this, it is in those moments when people move into those intersections and demand those constitutional rights, push the boundaries of our democracy, that we find our core democratic values. And I want to be clear with you, I'm going to say this several times today, I'm going to say it early, I'm going to say it often. In fact, I'm going to talk so fast, you're going to think I'm going to sell you a car. <laughs> but you're not going to find our core democratic values in the Constitution. You will not find them in Article 1, Section 8. You will not find them in, in, in Article 4, Section 2. That is not where our core democratic values are located. Our core democratic values we find in the asp aspirational language of the Declaration of Independence and the preamble. It's what we aspire to be. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. We don't always live up to it, but we aspire to that. We the people in order to form a more perfect union. It's that aspirational language that we find in the preamble that really defines our core democratic values. In fact, the National Council for the Social Studies has boiled down core democratic values for elementary students. I think these are powerful. It's worth the exercise of going through them with you. I think you'll find them entertaining. This is what they say. Number one, each citizen has a right to what? Help me here, you, can, you guys can speak life. Where are they taking that from? Not Article 1, Section 8. They're finding that in the Declaration of Independence. Take a look at the second one. The pursuit of what? You can't make this up. So literally, when those educators got together and said, what is it that we believe elementary students need to know? What are our core democratic values? They literally are lifting these out of the, 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 the phraseology of the Declaration of Independence. And look how they describe them. Each citizen can find happiness in their own way as long as they do not infringe on the rights of others. Look at number three, liberty, including the freedom to believe what you want, freedom to choose your own friends, to express your ideas and opinions in public, the right for people to meet in groups, and the right to have any lawful job or business. Then it gets cute. Justice. All people should be treated fairly in getting advantages and disadvantages of the country. No group of persons should be favored. Popular sovereignty, the power of the government comes from who? Truth, the government and citizens should not lie. I told you it was gonna get cute. Because if that's the case, then the government and citizens should not lie. In fact, I'll deal with that with you in just a second. I wanna go back to this issue of, of life and I wanna deal with this issue of citizenship because quite frankly, it's one thing to talk about those core democratic values having meaning, it's another thing to tease out the, the implications of the fact that this is a enterprise that over time has changed, right? So we the people, that meant one thing in 1789, right? Gonna mean something very different in 1830 in the age of Jackson with the expansion of the electorate. Gonna mean something very different in, in 1870 with the passage of the 13th, 14th, and ultimately the 15th Amendment. It's gonna mean something very different in 1920 when women win the elective franchise. It's gonna mean something different in 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It's gonna mean something very different in 2000. Remember those pregnant chads in Florida? It means something very different in 2008, and I think it's gonna mean something very different in 2016. Because the people have changed. Some people say that's the genius of our Constitution that has the ability, uh, uh, the power to be amended, to grow, to expand. 
But at the same time, it forces us to deal with those moments because let's be clear, if Hillary Clinton is to be elected the next president of the United States, she certainly wasn't the first woman to run, and Obama wasn't the first African American to run, and in fact, the first African American woman to run was Shirley Chisholm in 1972, and Shirley Chisholm, in defining her campaign, said to her followers, to her supporters, listen, let's be clear, I was the first American what? I had a right to do this. My birthright as an American citizen to run for the president of the United States. She continues. I was the first American citizen to be elected to Congress in spite of the double drawbacks of being female and having a skin darkened by melanin. When you put it that way, it sounds like a foolish reason for fame. Listen to her. In a what? And you guys have no energy. In a what? <laughs> and? I need you to understand this because they're critical words. She is connecting with eyes group here. They're in conversation. In a just and free democracy society, it would be foolish that I am a national figure because I was the first what? Person, not woman. You guys follow me here? Not African American, but person. Because black lives matter, black people matter, citizens matter. To be once a congressman, black and a woman proves I think that our society is not either just or free. I need you to follow me here because remember in 2008, uh, uh, remember Obama got in trouble in 2008 when he was uh, delivering his campaign message and, and Hillary Clinton accused him of stealing words or, or borrowing liberally from Deval Patrick of Massachusetts. Now what was interesting about that is that when you put Deval Patrick's words up against Obama's words, they did sound suspiciously close. Uh, Deval Patrick said, don't tell me words don't matter. Um, and you got Obama saying the same thing. Where I want to go with you is that when Hillary called Obama on it, Obama said, look, there are certain concepts in American history, there's certain language that you can't copyright, that nobody owns, because they're ultimately part of our DNA. Our dreams, how we nurture those dreams, and ultimately how we act upon those dreams when our democracy is in jeopardy. That's why in those moments when we find ourselves looking at or contesting the issue of Black Lives Matter, we say, look, I have a dream is something that transcends the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. You can't copyright that. You can't own that. But there's a problem when you get into the political uses of the past and you take that core, those core democratic values and you turn them into symbols. Because when you make Obama the fulfillment of the dream, when you play around with the symbols, then you got to deal with the history. And the history is complicated, like your Facebook status. It's messy. Remember, Obama talked so much about Lincoln and his love of Lincoln. And I love the fact that at least Blondin had just crossed Niagara Falls, walking that tightrope when Lincoln ran for the presidency. And cartoonists at the time chose to depict Lincoln Note this, balancing slavery, the black man on his back, on the Constitution. Same thing here in this depiction. But Obama finds himself as an African-American, the first African-American president, balancing the same issue of race. You just have to be steady so you don't give up when, we, um, up when we don't get all the way there. But it's difficult for him as an African-American president to have to deal with this issue and for people to say, hey, as a black man, because I know all of you remember this when Obama was first elected in 2008, the beer summit when Skip Gates got arrested and all of us, well, maybe just me, said, finally, somebody's going to stick it to the cops. Somebody's going to say, you shouldn't pull me over, treat me bad in a public space. And Obama said, we just need to talk. You guys come to the White House, we're going to sit down, we're going to have a beer. In retrospect, in 2016, that was the very wrong response to a very real problem. I want to be clear with you because we can talk about him walking that tightrope, but we also see Obama engaging in this rhetoric that seems to indicate that he is in interested in moving forward the, the democratic enterprise, but at the same time, we have to recognize it for what it is. It is rhetoric. Obama said in his second inaugural that that is our generation's task to make these words, these rights, these values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness real for every American. Being true to our founding documents, listen to him, does not require us to agree on every contour of life. 
It does not mean we will all define liberty, liberty in exactly the same way or follow the same precise path to happiness. Progress does not compel us to settle centuries-long debates about the role of government for all time, but it does require us to act in our time. But see, the problem, Mr. President, when you say that is that people's expectations outpace your rhetoric. And when people's expectations outpace your rhetoric, you know what they do? They treat the premise of a just democracy as reasonable, and they move forward into intersections that you didn't expect or could not anticipate because it sounded good, but you didn't recognize that people were going to act accordingly. I want to be very clear with you because the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King had a very different vision than Barack Obama. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said, the black revolution is much more than a struggle for the rights of Negroes. It's forcing America to face all of its interrelated flaws, racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. Obama wasn't trying to knock out militarism or materialism or neoliberalism. Just kidding. But the symbol looked really good, worked really well. I want to be clear with you when I say that because if we value life, if we buy this comparison that somehow the election of Barack Obama was supposed to complete the arc of the American Revolution, it's difficult for me to look at 12-year-old Joey Bass, ha-ha, laying on the cover of Life magazine, ha-ha, in 1967 on the streets of Newark, shot by National Guardsmen for looting, and to tell you that our core democratic values say that we value life. It's difficult for me to juxtapose that position or that picture of another child being chased down the street by the National Guard in Newark with his hands up in 1967, and to say to you that how do we go from Newark, New Jersey, 1967 to Ferguson, Missouri, 2014, and if, our, if we're moving forward in this democratic enterprise, then we got a problem because those images shouldn't look the same. I think it's cute, too, because somebody had a sense of humor when they took that picture. Because straight out of Compton wasn't out yet, but somebody in the mailbox wrote, blank the police. That used to be funny. I don't know why people don't find that funny. But maybe you're not laughing because it's not funny. Because maybe you're not laughing because this was the National Guard in 1967, and it had to be called out in riot gear. Those are the regular police. It's troubling to us because I graduated from high school in 1989 and we were all moved by Tiananmen Square and the image of that unknown gentleman facing down the tank in Tiananmen Square. And we do very well at pointing out and talking about the abuses that take place on foreign soil and hoping that democracy will take root among people who have no democratic traditions. And we hope for it and cherish it. And, and we speak about it in such august terms. And yet, in Ferguson, Missouri, with two images looking suspiciously clear, no one is drawn to the same conclusion on the national stage. No one laments the loss of democracy in Ferguson. If truth says the government and citizens should not lie, what the hell is going on in Flint? Those are core democratic values. When Michael Moore says, maybe we should arrest the governor, Governor Snyder, and yet, at the same time, you can look up and see that in Flint, there's actually a law that provides for 93 to, days to a year in jail if you're caught with your, pan, your unmentionable showing. This is our priority. And keep in mind, our president, in the midst of uh, just before Ferguson, was one of these people traveling around the country saying, pull your pants up. If you just practice the politics of black respectability, then things will be different. We want to blame this guy. We want to talk about the Donald Trump supporters and we want to talk about, you know, look at it in those, that context. But the, the fact of the matter is that some of those fingers are pointing back at us because at the end of the day, we wanted hope or we voted for hope and we didn't get justice. Because at the end of the day, it's ironic that you have an African-American president who ran on a campaign of hope and linked his presidency uh, to the, uh, the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, and the Supreme Court used that as an occasion to wipe away the protections established in the Voting Rights Act of 1965 in Shelby County versus Holder. I love this political cartoonist who said, the Supreme Court done washed away my racism.
But you know, here's the problem. American tragedies are historically born of a rejection, a repudiation of core democratic values. Triangle Shirtwaist Fire took 121 dead girls because we don't value life. We can look at the financial collapse, the panic of, well, insert panic here, uh, Reconstruction, the Scottsboro Boys, Hurricane Katrina. And it's interesting because Obama, in some sense, in speaking to the murder of Christina Green in Arizona, said, look, I want us to live up to her expectations. I want our democracy to be as good as she imagined it. All of us, we should do everything we can to make sure this country lives up to our children's expectations. But here's the problem that was raised yesterday by Peniel. Which children? The kids in Newtown or the kids in Compton? The kids in Austin or the kids in Philadelphia? The president the other day went to uh, the 25th anniversary of Teach for America and praised Teach for America for all that they've done for young people, providing high quality education in schools. And I had to take a pause and say, here was your opportunity, Mr. President, to get rid of this emphasis on charter schools, to really fund and resource public schools, to put money back into public education, to appoint somebody other than Arne Duncan, somebody who was a real advocate for public education, who understood this, to make this a priority, and you didn't. And when I look at that, I got to take a hard step back and say, which children? I don't want to put you to sleep. But when we go back to core democratic values, I got to tell you that when we talk about justice and her, I love this, Lady Justice and her blind seeing eye dog, She's blind, but the dog sees racial, racial bias. <laughs> that we don't understand, Callie and, and, and the panel that will follow me will talk about this. <laughs> when when six-year-olds are being arrested, see, the tragedy of Sandra Bland is not Eighth Amendment cruel and unusual punishment. The tragedy of Sandra Bland is the Sixth Amendment. The hell are you talking about, Yuhuru? The Sixth Amendment says, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. But see, when you get pulled over at 6 o'clock in the afternoon on a Friday, and the courts are closed down, and you got to spend the weekend in jail, that's a repudiation of our core democratic values. No one says that. They go, she shouldn't have been acting like that in the first place, rather than saying that if we weren't charging excessive bail, and if you don't believe me, read the Ferguson report, if we weren't literally putting people out of house and home to pay fines, you read what I just put up where it makes no sense, it is inhumane, it is cruel and unusual, it doesn't mark the progress of a maturing society as uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren wrote in Trump versus Dulles in 1958, to say that you're gonna throw somebody in jail for having their pants down, when the more appropriate solution would be, can you pull your pants up? We gonna incarcerate people for that? I don't wanna lose you because I'm preaching today. It feels like church up in here. I wanna be clear. I wanna tell you, because I'm running out of time, that maybe we need a little Dickens for the Joshua generation. The hell are you talking about now, Yuhuru? See, because remember, Dickens said it so well. And I think we'll look back on the age of Obama, at least those of us who've lived through it, and we'll say, literally, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the best of times because how could we not forget the exhilaration of election night? How could we not forget the promise of Obama? How could we not forget that the Nobel Peace Commission was so captivated by the promise of Obama that they gave him the Nobel Peace Prize and hadn't even done anything yet? And there were those of us, I went on a WVO in Chicago with Cliff Kelly after Peniel one day. And Peniel was sober, as he always is, and, and you know, laser-like, and I was on gushing. I think it's an appropriate choice. I am so glad they, Peniel called me after I knew I was in trouble. He said, brother, <laughs> what's wrong with you? I said, you don't understand. This was a great choice. He's going to pull. He said, brother. You need to go have some orange juice and call me back. And you need to brace yourself because, and, and see, deep down in my heart, I knew. But in that moment, we were euphoric because we believed that it was the best of times and anything was possible. I want to say this to you because Obama didn't lie to us. He told us point blank. 
I ser- in the audacity of hope, I serve as a blank screen on which people of vastly different political stripes project their own views. Sometimes you need a glass of orange juice before you can see that clearly. Let your blood sugar shed- settle a little bit. And once you get that message from Obama, then you can recognize that literally it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. It was a time literally, and it's not over, when American democracy and everything that we hold dear is in jeopardy. And we ask the question, if the bargain that Stefan Bradley talked about yesterday, the Faustinian bargain, guess what? We'll elect him, and then slavery's over. We're not talking about racism anymore. No more discussion of inequality. It's over. That's it. If it was worth it. Now, you can't hold him accountable for that, but remember Bill Clinton said it, this fairy tale. And I know Clinton didn't mean it in this context, but we've had eight years of fractured fairy tales. The fairy tale that everyone told themselves, people of my uh, stripe, that just wait for Obama to get his feet wet and things are going to change. You just wait. He's got a radical agenda. Wait till his second term. Now we're saying wait till he's out of the office and see what he does when he's out of office. Then we'll be saying wait till he dies. They'll put up a monument and the monument will speak. But the reality is, but the reality is, there hasn't been much hope and change in some arenas. It doesn't mean that we're taking away what he accomplished, but it means that we're being sober in a way that Peniel had advised. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we can't say that nothing was accomplished. I love this cartoon. Uh, This was Obama's first inaugural, and this is Obama's second inaugural. And I believe that's true for a certain segment of the population. But again, have those gains been general? Have they been across the board? It forces us to contend with the fact that we've got an African-American president, a Latina on the United States Supreme Court, an um, uh, uh, African-American attorney general. And yet, in 2016, we're arguing about the lack of diversity in the Oscars. That got a big laugh in Peoria. It's Nate Beeler in the Columbus Dispatch who says, look, if we look at our flag today, it is adorned by the stripes of poverty, family breakdown, broken schools, unemployment, drugs, persistent crime, hopelessness, police misconduct, government uh, corruption, and incivility. Can I get a Donald Trump? But I think the one that hurts the most is the hopelessness, because we were so hopeful in uh, 2008. After 10 months and almost 200 pages, it's funny that a Black Lives Matter t-shirt reduced the Ferguson Commission to what the the grand takeaway is. But why do we have to be reminded that life matters? I can't even do that one. It was an age of wisdom. It was an age of foolishness. Now, I could spend a lot of time here. I could spend a lot of time here talking about Herman Cain. I could spend some time here talking about Ben Carson. I could spend some time here talking about Donald Trump, but I want to talk about George Zimmerman. Well, why do you want to talk about George Zimmerman? Because George Zimmerman might be a punchline in a couple of years, but the fact that our jury system is broke, it's not going to be a punchline in a couple of years. The fact that prosecutorial misconduct is real won't be a punchline in a couple of years. The fact that the matter that stop and frisk and that black and brown bodies are not safe in public spaces won't be a punchline in a couple of years. The fact that the matter that stand your ground, which is inconsistent with life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness, won't be a punchline in, in a couple of years. It puts democracy literally in the gun scope of the gun lobby in this country. And the president cries, and I give him credit for taking action. But at the end of the day, how many new towns? I grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. This wasn't an issue when I was a kid, when kids were getting blasted all the time going to school. They put metal detectors in the school, and they put police officers in the school. Right? It wasn't an issue until Columbine, until it touched suburbia. Now it's an issue. But if you'd have dealt with it when they were killing black and brown kids, we may not have gotten to the point where we got a new town to begin with. 
Now, it's too late to say that, but it's important for us to recognize that we need to hold our next generation of political leaders accountable to the rhetoric that, that, that they use. That it's not enough in the aftermath, I got five minutes left, it's not enough in the aftermath for us to cry and to do the public hand-wringing and to be the, the mourner in chief. And I apologize if my critique of Obama is too much or superficial, but I do say that I got tired of the president crying and homogenizing our guilt and our sorrow over dead kids. Now, I want to be very clear with you. <laughs> I don't even have time. I want to be very clear with you that if we look at Obama over the last eight years and we ask what is the name, it was literally the age of opportunity and the age of oppression. Because what began with great promise ended up in a lot of ways with the president. I love this Russian cartoonist, Alexander Zudin, who basically said, here's Obama caught off guard in the same way that Dwight Eisenhower was caught off guard. And he's dropping Iraq and Russia into Ukraine because he's hit by demonstrations in his own backyard that he should have had. He, of all people, should have had a hold on. It is these images of American police turning their back on the mayor of New York City, who had the courage to speak out against police brutality and those adorned in the, the weapons of war. It is this picture by Daryl Cagle, I love this, which maps so nicely to the words of Jimmy Baldwin, who wrote in 1967, the only way to police a ghetto is to be oppressive. It means looking at Obama's words on foreign policy and understanding that at the end of the day, no matter what we say, when you drop drones and you end up killing innocent people, that it's hard for people to accept that the United States privileges life. That we get angry with Donald Trump for saying that maybe we should close our borders to Muslims, and of course that makes him an idiot, and everybody says that, but we also have to recognize that the use of drones has created as much animosity against the United States in the Middle East than anything that Donald Trump has said in the last two months. We have to recognize, as this Chinese cartoonist did, that CIA torture and the Ferguson protests go hand in hand, whether we want to recognize it or not, and that they taint our emphasis on our privileging of human rights. It forces us to recognize, in some sense, that Obama has been both blend and breach. He reached across the aisle, but we focused more on the breach than we did on the blend. We talked about his feet on the desk, him bowing to officials, him ha the, the, the flag pin controversy. I have on my lapel now a pin I got from uh, the Obama administration for going to Ferguson. He didn't give it to me. Probably be nicer if he did. <laughs> but I was very happy to have it. But what was important for me is that we also forgot to blend that. In some sense, what we'll take away from the age of Obama is the fact that when I went to, and I said this to you uh, yesterday, when I went to DC, it was the array of colors the rainbow coalition that has emerged in Black Lives Matter and other movements. It is Occupy. In the now again, people said, where were the black folks in Occupy? But we certainly have seen coalition building on a scale that we haven't seen in a long time. Peniel spoke to that yesterday as well. I'm running out of time. So we also have to deal with the A in Obama, the American and the alien. I mean, we still talk about people's birth certificates. I mean, the Ted Cruz thing to me is funny. I find that entertaining. But it really wasn't funny when they were talking about Obama. It's actually really not funny when they're talking about Ted Cruz. But it's not just the American and alien in terms of Obama being not a US citizen. It's the alien in terms of Obama being a person of color. And we don't want to deal with that. Because when Obama says Trayvon Martin could have been my child, and the response that Obama got when saying Trayvon Martin could have been my child, problematic. It's Obama the magnanimous and Obama the Marxist. It's Obama the dictator and Obama the, uh, the, the uh, author of, of health care. It's Obama the attentive and Obama the acrimonious. But at the end of the day, W.E.B. Du Bois has some advice for the Joshua generation. I'll end on these two slides. I'm done. Du Bois said, there was a day when the world rightfully called Americans honest, even if crude. Earning or living by hard work, telling the truth no matter whom it hurt, and going to war only on what they believed a just cause after nothing else seemed possible. Today we are lying, stealing, and killing. We call all this by finer names, advertising, free enterprise, and national defense. But names in the end deceive no one. Today we use science to help us deceive our fellows. We take wealth that we never earned and we are devoting all of our energies to kill, maim, and drive insane men, women, and children who dare to refuse to do what we want done. No nation threatens us. 
we threaten the world. Honest men may, may and must criticize America, describe how she ruined her democracy, sold out her jury system, and led her seats, to least seats of justice astray. The only question that may arise is whether this criticism is based on truth, not whether it has been openly expressed. Now, I'm not saying that as an indictment on our system. I'm saying it because we still have the opportunity in some sense, if we look at the language of the preamble, to recognize that this was never about Obama. And Obama's credit, he told us that. This has always been about we the people. Because the preamble to the Constitution begins not on talking about people that we elect, but talking about us. Charlene Hunter Galt was an important person to start all this off because at the end of the day, if she doesn't decide, if we all don't take individual responsibility, collective responsibility for our democracy, then we can't expect anything other than to be let down. John Hope Franklin and Abraham Eisenstein in the opening of the American History series write that every generation writes its own history for the reason it sees the past and for short perspective of its own experience. But we don't just write our own history, we make our own history. And our refusal to take action, to make that history, to tackle the issues of poverty, injustice, violence, and ignorance, place us on the same plane as the political leaders that we are so apt to criticize. Because at the end of the day, the constitutional enterprise ain't about what happens in the White House. It's about what happens in your my house. Thank you. Should have had this all set up. But. Okay, um, let's get some. Thank. Well, let's get a round of applause for our keynote speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Very energetic. Very dynamic. Um, all right, let's get some questions. Um, hopefully, we've got some students here too, uh, whether they're LBJ students or um, I see some students in my civil rights class. Uh, Alvin, I see you hiding over there. I see you, brother. Come on, ask a question. We were talking about some of this in class today, brother. Come on. Rencia, yeah. And after that, uh, I won't pick on anybody. Uh, name's Alvin Sanchez, LBJ student. Uh, you were talking about coalition building. Uh, how does that work within the black-white binary? We often discuss race relations in this country. recognize at the end of the day that when you bring young white, uh, white kids of privilege to Mississippi and you involve them in that enterprise to um, help register blacks to vote, you're going to bring attention, right? It's ironic for me that in a lot of ways the Black Lives Matter movement has been so amplified because this is one of the first times that we've seen young people of color across a range, so Latinos, Asians coming together and saying, in this movement, we recognize ourselves and we're making this case because this isn't just about black and brown bodies, it's about undocumented bodies. It's about queer bodies of color, right? And that coalition then isn't necessarily in terms of the white-black binary, it's in terms of these groups who previously may not have seen past the silos to recognize that, wait a minute, black lives matter, black queer lives matter, queer lives matter, right? Um, undocumented lives matter. And so in that sense, I think what you're getting is a much broader coalition that recognizes in the language of this hashtag activism an opportunity to see um, the, the chance to contend for their own liberty, to contend for their own uh, safety. That's excellent. Qu uh, questions? People are like, no, I got it. <laughs> I got this, it. This is going to go on my diary, <laughs> Panera. That's great. <laughs> Come on, questions? Any students out here? We've got a question right there. Uh, what, uh, what's to identify be made yourself, please? of the, can you hear me, by the way? Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. What's to, what's to be made of? Oh, can you identify yourself, please? Jonathan Davis, Jonathan. LBJ, uh, master's student, first year. Oh, great. Um, what's to be made of the relationship between um, kind of past movements and the Black Lives Matters now in 
kind of the attempted silencing of the movement, especially as it relates to uh, how a lot of individuals believes it's how uh, only black lives matter. I remember seeing not too long ago kind of a, a transposition of, of two um, photos, one from, one from the late 60s, I'm sure you're familiar with one, one from the late 60s, where a man was saying, I am a man, and you see there's a, uh, a, a white man that's, that's saying, like, shut up, like, it's, you need to be quiet. And it shows that the transposition now to where it's Black Lives Matter and it's shut up, no, all, all lives matter. Uh, it's a good question. You know what, what's cute about the all lives matter thing is, <laughs> what's cute about it is um, we sometimes read faith out of our discussion of civil rights movement. And certainly we can talk about Martin Luther King as a charismatic minister within the Baptist church, but Malcolm X was also a minister, so we, we don't talk about that. But I think the reason it's important and appropriate in the context of Black Lives Matter is that there's this whole notion, even in our discussion about democracy, right, and, and, and that discourse, that if you're not ensuring those blessings for the least of your brothers, then it undermines the whole uh, nature of making the appeal that any life matters. So if you're looking at black and brown bodies being shot down in the streets and your response is all lives matter and you don't want to deal with the Walter Scotts, the Tamir Rices, the Sandra Blands, the Raynette Turners, um, and all the, all the names of the people that we don't know before this became a problem, all the people like McDonald in Chicago whose cases are coming out now because we're more aware, then you do yourself a disservice of saying, and in my attempt to silence this movement, I fail to recognize that my own life, my own liberty in some sense may be in jeopardy. There was a slide that I didn't get to that I wanted to show you of a graveyard, a cemetery, and it shows all these tombstones, and it shows all these people who are victims of gun violence. And I think when we get to that point where, and we started to see this a couple years ago, where you got, um, you, you know, not to be crude, white folks getting shot in the theater because they turned their cell phone on. Because see, that's insane. That's not stand your damn ground. That's insane. That's not a castle doctrine. That's foolish. I think when you get to that space, then you'll be in a position where people will, will, will stop with that rhetoric. But in terms of, of silencing the movement, in terms of, of efforts to kind of take the focus off of the importance of black life, I think part of the reason that the, that has resonated so powerfully with people is because it needs to be said in exactly those terms. That's what W.E.B. Du Bois was talking about in both quotes, the one from 1903 and the one toward the close of his life. That if you're not prepared to deal with undocumented students, if you're not prepared to deal with queer lives, if you're not prepared to push democracy to its logical conclusion, then you're never gonna have a democracy that's democratic and just. What you're gonna have are, are these compromises, which at their core are undemocratic because they're about winning the greatest possible consensus and not necessarily about ensuring the greatest liberty for all people. You got a question right here? I was about to play Oprah and run up to him. <laughs> Got my Fitbit on. I was all over that. Um, I just pulled this up on the internet because I want to get the quote precisely. Uh, Martin Niemöller, if you're familiar with it, I'd like to see if you could connect this quote a bit to the things you've been talking about. Um, it was a pastor during the Holocaust. First they came for the socialists. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. I did not speak out because I'm not, I'm not a trade unionist. And they came for the Jews, I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Uh, not only am I familiar with that, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful quote. First they came for the elementary teachers. <laughs> then they came for the, now they're coming for the, high, the, the professorate, right? Now I'm saying that in the context of my own self-interest, right? Because now as we talk about, um, you know, Bernie Sanders and others are talking about free education. And, and I support that to a certain extent. I also have to recognize that part of this push, right, is going to involve putting people out of work and, and redefining higher education as we know it. There are going to be a very small number of people that can go to elite institutions, and there are going to be the colleges for everybody else. That's not about, that's the TFA model where you say, look, we want high quality teachers in the classroom, but no one's being honest and saying a high quality teacher can't be somebody that you pluck out of college and throw into inner cities and assume that they're gonna be capable to the job. You want your best trained, best educated, best equipped, best prepared people to be in those positions. That means additional education, not four years and thrown in. 
So it's the dishonesty, the intellectual dishonesty in the discussion and our inability to recognize in the suffering of others our own interests that perpetually puts us at risk and creates those American tragedies. It is the fact that people watched human beings, got to say it that way, in Hurricane Katrina. People watched it. And it took Kanye West, God bless him, because I can't stand his music, but it took Kanye West to say, <laughs> President Bush doesn't care about black people. Thank God they wired his jaw shut and he was able to speak and made that song through. Thank God he could say, and did say, in the, at the most inopportune time, in the most amplified space that he, he possibly could say, President Bush doesn't care about black people. But the irony is that if that had been any place else, the Jersey Shore, post Sandy, Look at the response to Sandy, look at the response to Katrina. Yeah. And that says it all. So it's right. a great question. Great, all right, great we'll, we'll do one more question. We'll do the last one. Uh, outstanding presentation uh, and, and very gripping. I just, quick question, how could Flint, Michigan happen? And then what do you see as the, the result of all of this? Yeah, and I know it's a, Thanks, Stefan. I was having a good time up here. Um, you, you know, Steph, to tell you the truth, I, I was talking about this the other night. Um, Flint is Love Canal, but people forgot Love Canal, right? Flint is Three Mile Island. Um, what makes Flint so real for so many of us, I think it's a, in such a way that's so um, visceral, is because Flint is that thing that, th this is the horror movie that Stephen King talked about and why we crave horror film, films where literally, this is the monster that's under your bed that people told you didn't exist. And then you're like, you look under the bed and there's the monster, you're like, damn it, it exists. But too late for you to do anything about it. The fact that Snyder and the administration knew what was happening in Flint, the fact that they were shipping in bottled water for employees, the fact that they deliberately lied, deliberately lied to the people there, and that there's no, that it was an easy fix, and yet even though they had at their disposal that easy fix and they chose, It's uh, Coke America, the Coke Brothers America. Um, it's the easy solution America. It's the, um, for lack of a better term, buy now, pay later America. That should make all of us uncomfortable. And in some sense, uh, when you hear the people in Flint talk about the water situation there, and they said, look, we felt like it tasted funny, right? We felt like something was wrong. And no one did anything to correct the problem. It reminds me of so many other of these public health crises that aren't public health crises until they're exposed, right? Or until somebody that matters, which is why I wrote that piece in uh, the Huffington Post that got a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, play. You're nobody till somebody kills you in response to Freddie Gray. And literally in this country, until it happens to somebody that matters, it ain't happening to nobody. Great question. Thank All you. All right, thank you.